So today we will uh, move on to hazard and operability study. It's one of the many hazard identification techniques, some of which I have mentioned in one of the earlier lectures. But HAZOP, the short form of hazard and operability study, is the most structured method available today and it is the most widely accepted method that is used in identifying hazards. Now, as you know, the idea of identifying hazards is essentially seeking an answer to the question, what is the likely accident scenario, okay, in a qualitative terms. Because after that, you would like to model that accident scenario in order to derive the risk, both individual as well as societal, from that particular accident scenario. A typical plant, you know, given its scale would have very many accident scenario, possible accident scenarios. So the hazard and operability study is supposed to look at an entire plant in a systematic manner, starting typically from the upstream side and moving equipment by equipment as they are connected in the downstream side. So that you take the first unit, do a hazard, and then you move to the second unit through which there is a flow from the first to the second unit and so on and so forth. All major equipments need to be studied through HAZOP, uh, especially, you know, separation phenomenon, a reaction, okay. Uh, these are the major, you know, sort of equipments which uh, require this kind of analysis because they typically carry inventories and also the storage area. Okay, now we will begin with uh, the basic idea of HAZOP and then we will illustrate by two examples. You know, I would expect you to solve some problems on your own when I give it to you. So, HAZOP can be applied to very many areas of plant operation, right from new designs, okay, new processes, which eventually will translate into a new design, okay operating procedures, modification of existing plants and processes. So when I say processes, uh, I include uh, operating procedures there, then computer controlled processes, drains, vents and interconnections. So many equipment have drains, which is to actually drain out undesirable condensate, for example. Suppose you have a hydrocarbon you know, equipment and there is some water which is coming through. So over the time that water will condense and it being heavier, it will go to the bottom of the equipment where hydrocarbons, which are typically lighter, would be above. So you can drain the water away because uh, from that equipment, when the hydrocarbon moves downstream, you don't want the water to go along with it, okay? Vents are ones which are typically for pressure relief. Okay, and interconnections are essentially the pipelines and also the recycle loop, pipelines which connect different equipment. During the construction as well as during demolition, you can apply HAZOP. The idea is that HAZOP has certain philosophy, okay. Now, if you see all these are different applications, okay, but the basic idea of HAZOP can be applied to any of these processes, although they are structurally very different, okay. So the concept of HAZOP has to be understood and translated into the application that is at hand. And of course, commissioning and decommissioning, that is when you start up the plant and then when you actually decommission, that is to say you take apart the plant because of its age or other considerations and also contractual operations. So in a typical industry, there are many operations which are outsourced, okay. This has been the kind of, uh, you know, strategy adopted for the last 15 to 20 years because, you know, many operations which are not routine operations, okay. They can be outsourced because that is more you know, economic for the company instead of maintaining a large, larger workforce to attend to those sporadic jobs. Okay, maintenance 
you know, jobs, for example, they are often outsourced. Okay. And believe me that many of the hazardous operations, which are sporadic, they are often outsourced. Okay. That is why when you have this contract operations, which is the last of these, this list. So when you have contractual employees working, okay, so the way the contractor works, the safety practices of the contractor is very much also a concern for the parent organizations, which is employing that contractor. Because ultimately, any incident, if it happens, it will happen on the site of the owner. You can, one cannot sort of wish it away and say that, okay, it is the contractors who actually created this, you know, situation and therefore I'm not responsible for it. Yeah, maybe, but who suffers the loss? The, the owner actually suffers the loss. Of course, the contractual agreement will sort of try to cover those losses. But at the end of it, it's a disturbance. It leads to discontinuation of the project, okay, or whatever work that is being executed. And it would have an impact on the, you know, the main operation. For example, suppose it's a sporadic, you know, annual maintenance of an equipment. And if there is a failure and a major incident happens, accidents do happen during contractual maintenance operations as well, okay. So therefore, that will put the entire production process off gear and you will be, one will be forced to actually accept a production outage. So the loss would have to be borne by the company to some extent. So therefore it is important that this aspect is also looked into. So the alignment of the safety motto or safety philosophy of the contractor must be done with the safety practices and philosophy of the owner organization. So that is something that has to be looked into. So we will see what is the basic idea of HAZOP and why it can be applied to so many different, you know, seemingly different aspects of plant operation. Now, whenever you look at a plant, so I've told you earlier that if I ask you to visit a plant and then ask you the question, can you find out what kind of accidents will take place? What would be the scenarios? It's a very difficult question to answer unless you have a systematic kind of a methodology to really extract that, prop, that particular scenario, okay? It would be something that would be missed, okay? So uh, HAZOP actually steps in there and provides a very structured methodology of finding an answer to the question, what can go wrong? So obviously you have to look at equipment wise, you have to start from the upstream and look at all the major equipments where there are large inventories of hazardous materials. So there is a design intent for each equipment. When you do the process design, what do you do? You generally size the equipment, you determine the operating conditions, which will be the normal operating conditions, okay? And then you do the mechanical design, you do the detailed design, okay? Now, the design intent is that the equipment will function in the range that it is designed for. So if you have a certain temperature, which has to be maintained in a reactor, a certain pressure. So the idea of the intent is that the reactor under normal conditions should be operating, you know, in that range of temperature and pressure plus minus the control limit. Okay. But an incident will begin if there is a deviation from that normals. So there can be deviation from that. Now, we need to find out why and what kind of deviation will take place, which can flare up into a major accident. See, I have distinguished incident and accident. Incidents are ones which are typically, it's the umbrella for all kinds of deviation and abnormal situations. Accidents are a subset of that, which leads to a actual human loss or a property loss or a production loss some form or an environmental impact. So therefore, an accident is one which is associated with an actual loss. An incident actually can be a near miss or an accident, all right? Now, once you know that there can be a deviation, a possible deviation from the design intention, that is to 
let's say you have a pipeline carrying hydrocarbon, uh, heavy hydrocarbon between two equipments. Now, what is the design intent? The design intent is that it should operate at some temperature, some pressure. It should have gaseous hydrocarbon. That is what you have designed for. That is the stream. And maybe it's a mixture or maybe it's a pure component, okay, depending on the process. And there is a certain flow rate that has to be maintained. So then you design the pipe in terms of basic design based on these aspects. Temperature pressure will go into the determination of the thickness of the pipe and flow rate will be used in order to size the pipe, the internal diameter of the pipe. Okay. Now that is the basic in intention of the design. Now it can undergo a deviation from that. What kind of deviation can it happen? The temperature may escape the control envelope, pressure may increase or it can go below or it can go above the normal limit. The flow can change, the flow can go high, it can go low, okay. Uh, the material is supposed to be gaseous, it can become liquefied, that's also a change. So those are all deviations. Now once we identify these deviations can take place. We have to understand that this deviation is something that is tenable, that it is likely to happen. You may actually imagine many deviations which are not likely to happen, okay? So they have to be discarded and you have a bounding set of possible deviations and for each those deviation you have to find out what could cause those deviations, okay? Essentially you have to look upstream for those kind of causes. They will typically originate in the upstream side. Can it originate in the downstream side? Under what conditions do you think a disturbance downstream can actually affect an equipment? What kind of configuration will actually allow you that, allow that to happen? When there is a recycle, when there is a recycle loop, any disturbance downstream can be communicated back upstream. Okay, so it is still possible that some disturbances may come from the downstream side of it. Now for each of those causes of those deviation, we have to find out what is the consequence. Okay, in terms of finally leading to either a near miss situation or an accident situation. So these consequences are actually the accident scenarios that we are looking at. Once we identify those scenarios, then we can move on to risk analysis. Now, obviously when you design a plant, especially when you do detailed engineering is done, and I'll show you uh, an example of it. Not only you do the thickness calculations and sizing of all equipment, but you also include safeguards. For example, you know, a pressure relief valve, okay? Or a, a, let's say an alarm, okay? High temperature alarm a high, high temperature alarm, high pressure alarm, a low pressure alarm, high flow alarm, low flow alarm. So alarms can be established as part of the design, okay? You can also have an emergency shutdown system, okay? So that if there is a certain deviation in a reactor, the pump that is uh, pumping the reaction reactants can be shut down automatically, okay? By sensing the high temperature and abnormal situation, the pump will be taken off circuit, okay? So that is again a safeguard. So if you really look at the layers of protection, all of those are safeguards, okay? So obviously when we look at a part of the plant and we are now looking at the possible abnormal situation, okay? So please note that you would have completed the design, the basic design and also the detailed engineering. So the P and ID, the piping and instrumentation diagram would be now available to you, okay, because the design is complete. And therefore, you are not examining the design itself, which, which is what it should actually apply if the system is working normally, quote unquote normally. But in HAZOP, we are not interested in the normal situation. We are looking at the abnormal situation. So the design will not give you that answer. So we have to 
actually engineer an abnormal situation by a conceptual mechanism and then examine that abnormal situation in terms of its upstream causes and its downstream consequences. Okay. Now, obviously, there would be safeguards when you do the design. Then what is the purpose of doing a ASOP and trying to identify an accident scenario? The safeguards are supposed to control them, right? So safeguards would be established assuming that there are some possible scenarios. Why would you actually use a pressure relief valve? You know that the pressures can fluctuate and go above a certain value. Let's say you are actually storing a volatile material. So during summer when the temperatures rise beyond the average annual temperature, okay, you would have more volatilization and therefore pressurization of that particular vessel. Now, you don't want catastrophic failure. That's why you put a relief valve so that it will pop up. It will simply release some of the material and that can be taken to the flare and burnt off. Okay. If it's a toxic material, then it has to be led to a scrubber. Okay. The scrubber will, you cannot release it into the environment directly. So the scrubber will try to, it's a typically a water solution, aqua solution of some material. Okay, or it can be a simply water itself. Okay, and that will try to take it out of the relieved vapor. And then that can go to the effluent treatment part of the plant. Now, if there is some material still escaping the scrubber, it would have to be taken to the flare and burnt off. Okay, so this is the typical you know, scenario. So you see there are safeguards already available. Now, why I will therefore doing this as of if those accident scenarios have already been anticipated and you have already put in safeguards. Well, the question is that during the design, which is based on standards and standard practices, the question is that have you been able to identify every possible accident scenario, which is unlikely. Therefore, that is why you are now trying to look at it in the mode that what happens if the system behaves abnormally. When you do the design, you have not considered that as much, in not in much detail. You have just assumed some standard practices. Okay, it's a pressure vessel, so you need a pressure relief valve. So if it's a toxic material in, in, in service, you have to lead it to a scrubber, and then you have to design a flare. Now, uh, if, it's, if it has a large inventory and it's a hazardous inventory, it is better to have an alarm to alert the operator in case of abnormal, you know, temperature, pressure, or flow rates, and so on. They are very standard practices and therefore these are very much part of the initial design. Okay? But those eventualities have already been considered at the design phase. Now what you are looking at is that what happens if it really breaches the control envelope and the accident propagates. Under those conditions what should you do? So there are already safeguards. So the question is that or I would say there are already some layers of protection already available. So the action items are, do you need extra safeguards? Would you like to add more safeguards? Okay, that is the question that you want to address. So those would become the action items for you after you do the hazard. So you have to enlist what are the things that you need to additionally you know, incorporate in the design so that those abnormal specific situations which has the potential for becoming a catastrophic accident, those are controlled. Okay, so what would be your strategy when you decide on action items? You should try to look at options which will reduce the possibility of that accident, the likelihood, the frequency, therefore add to the inner layers of protection which are supposed to control the frequency of the accident. Because if you, if you reduce the likelihood, you know, and there is a possibility that it may not really happen during the lifetime of the plant itself. Okay. But since there is a residual chance or a frequency that it may happen, okay, it may be one in thousand years, but it can happen within the lifetime of the plant also. That is why you will also have to invest in post-release mitigation, the outer layers of protection. So therefore, you will have to buy a mix of two, both frequency limiting as well as consequence limiting safeguards. 
So you have a standard, you know, layers of protection, typical framework, and you see then if you have an alarm, let us say an oper and manual intervention, which is there, let's say in a runaway situation, okay, with a reactor. So you have a high temperature alarm, and then you have uh, already actually have a procedure for detection of what has gone wrong by manual intervention, and then maybe shutting down the the inlet valve, doing it manually. So therefore, you have two layers of protection. One is the alarm, and second is the manual intervention. So there would be a kind of a troubleshooting and a standard procedure for doing that. So what the operator will look at is that, okay, he will look at what is the temperature at the point of deviation. And if it is supposed to, let's say, operate at 100 degrees centigrade, and then if it, let's say, if it goes to 110, he will initiate a shutdown. So that would be the procedure. Now, you have identified that, you know, this is our likely scenario. And therefore, you have already included an alarm. And in the procedural part, you are actually asking the operator to operate in this particular manner. Now, so therefore, you have two levels of safeguard, the alarm and the manual intervention. The question is that, do you want to add anything else? So, this scenario, the runaway scenario is already now available because it's a highly exothermic situation, let's say the reaction, and it is understood that there can be a, you know, possible excursion of the temperature if the cooling mechanism fails. The coolant is supposed to take care of the, uh, of the temperature and maintain the temperature. Any excess heat that is being generated by the reaction is supposed to be taken away, okay? What happens if the coolant fails? the pump which is actually pumping the coolant suddenly fails, then you don't have any coolant. So therefore the temperature will now sort of start rising. So the alarm will sound and the person will intervene and what has he got to do? He has to detect why the temperature has gone high. Okay, so he has to correctly detect that it is the pump that has failed. Okay, now we will come to the case study and you will see that same cause there can be multiple ways that same, you know, loss of cooling can happen. We'll look at it. So now, uh, the question which you want to ask is that, are you satisfied with these two layers of protection? So you know that a potential runaway can result. Okay, there can be many causes of that. We will see that shortly. So obviously, you have a manual shutdown. So manual intervention is there. So now you team doing the HAZOP will have to deliberate and then say, okay, I think uh, this poses a substantial risk because, you know, it has a large inventory of, let's say, a flammable or a toxic substance. If there is an actual catastrophic rupture because of high temperature and high pressure, then it will get released and it may lead to a major explosion or a fire or a large scale toxic exposure. Okay. Now, I don't want that to happen. So alarm can fail when it is called to function. So there is a likelihood, maybe one in 10 times it will fail. The manual intervention may not work because he may not be able to detect correctly what has really gone wrong and has created the high temperature situation. So, and meanwhile, the temperature will keep on increasing. Temperature, because there is no action. There is no mitigative action. So therefore it will keep on increasing. So then, he is supposed to actually shut down the reactor or shut down the inlet, the reactant, uh, when the temperature goes to 110 degrees. But suppose he fails to do that, then what happens? Then the scenario that it will simply go and run away. You have no more layers of protection. So therefore there is, now you have to debate whether you want an extra safeguard. What would be the safeguard? could be an emergency shutdown, automated shutdown. So even if the manual shutdown fails, the automated shutdown will work. Okay. So therefore you have added an extra layer of protection. So that is the action item for you. Now, why would you actually do that? That is what we will look at shortly. Now, the basic uh, philosophy of HAZOP is that there are design parameters which will define the normal behavior of a particular plant. It could be a pipeline, it could be a reactor, 
could be stellation column, heat exchanger, whatever. Okay, so let's say a pipeline. The design intention signifies the parameters which have to be controlled and maintained. So the flow is one design parameter, temperature is one, pressure is another, phase is another. Okay, so therefore these design intents are characterized by these parameters, temperature, pressure, flow and phase. So these parameters, when they deviate from normal values, okay, that will lead to a situation of potential, you know, incident. Okay, that is what we want to find out. Now, how do I, I generate that deviation? It is by application of guide words and we will just come, come to that. Guide words are simply, you know, phrases which you add to the actual parameter. Then when you add this to the parameter, it generates a deviation a phrase which gives you the likely deviation that is likely to take place. And then you have to brainstorm and find out the cause and consequences. Now this is typically, I'll come to the details when we look at an actual case study. This is a typical study composition. Now I have told you that there are potentially many people who can become part of the hazard identification study team. But it is important to limit the size, okay? Because in a typical plant, you know, in an actual operation, if you make the team very large, now why would you do that? Because you think that you want to basically take the expertise of as many people as you have so that you have a foolproof study and therefore you don't miss out any accident scenarios. Can you miss out accident scenarios? Surely you can because it's a simply a qualitative brainstorming exercise. So it depends on the accomplishment, expertise and the mental application of the team itself. So if you don't have a good team, Okay, you don't get a good result. So this is something which has been clearly established by pilot studies that if you don't have a good team, the outcome of the study is poor. By a good team, I mean people who participate, all people participate. Between they, they, them, they have the complete expertise that is needed in order to study. And also the experience, a typical novice who, do, who have not, who has not developed a complete familiarity with the process over a reasonable period of time, he or she may not be able to really contribute well to the HAZOP study. Okay. Uh, once we look at the actual case, we will see some more details. A typical team should comprise of a team leader because it, it's a team exercise. So you need to have a leader. Now, who makes a good leader? Somebody who is actually schooled in HAZOP and has actually participated you know, in his profession, in his or her professional life over many such studies. So the experience is very critical. He has to really keep the key team together and forge consensus as the study unfolds. You know, try to make sure that everybody is on the same platform because everybody has to sign the document and own the document. Because if an incident happens, people will first study whether the HAZOP was actually done. I'll give you my own experience. Okay, last year I investigated an accident in in Baroda, uh, about sixty kilometers away from Baroda. This was fairly large, you know, company, and they were largely focused on producing halogenated hydrocarbons. Okay, so in a distillation column, a major rupture happened. Okay, I mean, it was followed by, it was basically processing hydrocarbons and there was an internal explosion leading to the complete splitting of the distillation column and about eight people died on the plant and another 15 to 20 were injured. So the plant went into a shutdown and I think it was in a shutdown for more than a year. Okay, so they had to take help of, you know, other facilities and contractual kind of operations in order to manage their production outage. So when I looked at their, so the first thing I asked them when I was investigating, when incidentally the incident, uh, you know, I was contacted because the usually what happens in all such accidents, the insurer, what would the insured do? You will lay a claim, right? You have, you take insurance, right? So let's say you have a medical claim. So if you undergo some kind of a medical treatment in a hospital, what do you do after either, you know, once the treatment is over and you're discharged, 
you will lay a claim with the insurer to recover that money right okay of course you have cashless you know possibilities that you uh, if we inform the inform the hospital that you are insured with company x they will directly contact them and take their expenditures from there itself but in an industry it doesn't happen that way it's not something which is cashless in that sense so the insurer the insured will have to lay a claim so he has to prepare the company has to prepare a document sort of clearly you know outlining the accident having some preliminary investigation and then assess the damage that has been caused in monetary terms so if you have a part of the plant that is damaged you will have to basically look at the replacement cost all right if there are injuries if there are fatalities compensations would have to be taken care of so largely you when you go for insurance you do the property insurance all right and individual insurance for life has to be done through other agencies but most of the losses the losses typically of the properties are usually they outweigh the losses or compensation that have to be given to human you know uh, human beings so when you put up the claim the <laughs> let me tell you you know within the walls of this room the first impulse of the insurance companies to deny the claim okay so it's an uphill task i'll give you my experience my car had a you know minor accident but it has been one month since i actually put up the claim and the insurance company is not able to make out or come to the conclusion whether they should approve my claim or not so they are not convinced that uh, you know this is an accident which is an act of god okay so they have their own exclusions so they are trying to deny the claim and i am trying to tell them no 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 it was a genuine situation and i am covered for in the insurance anyway and it's an unlimited claim so that is the kind of insurance i have taken so if there is an accident once i report it i should get the claim okay but it is still stuck in a kind of a you know sort of a situation where we are still trying to even out the bit the situation and see as much as possible how much claim they will give typically they will not give everything even if you go for medi claims for example typically you get 80% the rest 20% you know however much you argue they will not give you that 20% that is their margin maybe and it's a kind of a doubt that is how it happens also in the industry as well okay so there is uh, something that once the claim is made it has to be bolstered so the insurer what it does once the claim document is received they appoint a surveyor okay who will go and actually examine the claim physically visit it physically see what has actually suffered damage okay and then try to connect that to the monetary compensation that you have asked for okay so the surveyor for my car did the same thing okay so he came and inspected the car there were damages on both sides left and right side okay so he was not convinced that it is from the same accident okay so he said no i'll only give you the left side damages not the right side damages okay so then i said that okay there was another accident which happened and therefore you know another car grazed by the right side it was not my fault it was on a traffic signal you know they want the, the car wanted to overtake me so they said no i then we can only give you one claim at a time we won't give you two claims so i said okay i mean that is the policy so anyway eventually you know both claims were at, were actually recognized okay but you see the impulse of the company is to really assess whether you are putting up the claim correctly and there is a genuine reason for that because many times i would say a very large fraction of the times there is an inflation of the claim your actual loss could be maybe 5 crores but the company will lay a loss of 10 crores okay he is probably insured for 10 crores anyway okay so you will try to maximize the claim okay so the insurer will try to see what is the actual loss 
So in this accident, when I, when I was involved, yes, please. Yeah, I mean, see, it, it, it cannot go to 10 crores, surely. Then you have to make an estimate, you have to rebuild the plant, that part would be there, okay. So, surveyor actually does that costing. When he goes there, he finds out whether it actually the damaged part will cost you 5 crores. So, that is his job. So, he has that experience, okay. But the additional safety systems that what you want, okay. So, the company is not, the insurer is not responsible for your safety systems. He will say, why didn't you in the first place, I established them. When you actually got the capital, why didn't you do it at that point of time? Why do you want me to finance that? I will only give you whatever you have lost, not beyond it. That would be the general kind of a strategy. The reason why the inflation of the claim often happens is that many times accidents are quote unquote engineered because the company is not doing well financially. The accident actually somehow happens and the claim is made so that you can recover the money and put in some money into the capital. Some accidents are often done, you know, which when you actually try to piece together, you see that it cannot happen because it's a very simple reason that the accident has happened. If you cannot have a system to detect that simple cause, there is a suspicion that is cast on that. So, you, typically what happens, obviously it's a contentious issue as you may say that you as an owner, you will say, no, I mean, it is not my fault if the accident happens because you may do a lot of things, you may have a very good system, but still the accident can happen because on that particular day, you know, there was some oversight that can still happen. That is why you are insuring. Why are you insuring? You are insuring because of this unexpected, unpredictable scenario. So, despite all your efforts, Okay, there is a residual risk and that risk is insured. So that you spread the risk. Risk is basically a commodity. Some of it you do manage by HAZOP and risk analysis and build in good safety systems, good procedures, but still there is a residual risk. That risk is actually the ones that is insured. So if the accident actually happens, okay, then, yeah. Are willing to so, no, I mean, when you, when you say it, no, I don't take, take my saying so seriously. But what happens is that uh, it, it, it can happen because of obvious negligence. Okay, negligence can be intentional, it can be unintentional. Okay, so, and on top of the, but if, if you are not convinced that accidents can be engineered, but the claim can surely be engineered. Okay, so you may show, yeah, in fact, I'll, I, I'll give you, you know, my experience again in another situation. So where there was a fair amount of inflation of claim and the extent to which the company went in order to say that and maintain that the claim was genuine. Anyway, so in this case, first let me discuss this point that uh, the insurer had, in fact, uh, this Baroda accident had employed an insurer. I mean, surveyor who had gone there and had done the investigation and there was the report of the surveyor which showed that there was some amount of negligence from the uh, company, but the company wouldn't agree to that. So therefore, the insured and the insurer became engaged in a typical battle, a okay, quote-unquote battle. Eventually, this often becomes a legal case. So the insured will file a case in the court and then the insurer would have to join. So the legal case will you know, drag on for years sometimes before you get a kind, some kind of a resolution. So anyway, so it is at that point, because of this battle which was not being settled, the company decided to employ me as a third, as a third party consultant in order to break the deadlock, okay? So yeah, 
So when I first went there, I of course studied the accident scenario and everything that was done. But as part of the investigation, I had largely concluded myself without telling them what was the likely cause of the accident. Okay. And it was a complicated cause, no doubt. Then I told them to give me their HAZOP report. The HAZOP would have to be done before commissioning, typically, because at the detailed engineering stage, once the P&ID is available, you do the HAZOP before you actually build and commission. Okay. So, and lo and behold, I found out it is that particular scenario which was missed out in the HAZOP. And that is the route by which the accident happened. Okay, so they had actually failed to identify the accident scenario. So the point which I'm trying to say is that this is simply a qualitative brainstorming exercise. Okay, and if you miss it, there will be no safeguards against it. So once the accident happens, you cannot control it. Okay, so that is what is so critical about this ASOP study. Now the pilot studies have been made and it is generally understood that if it is done diligently, you know, nearly 90% of the accident scenarios are typically identified. It is those 10% which are very rare accidents and which are a combination of very many failures. They tend to get overseen during HAZOP. And unfortunately, when the accident happens, you can find out it is by that route the accident has happened, which has not been covered, which has not been pre-identified. So therefore, it is very important to do the study diligently and create a good team which has a sufficiently good expertise and experience in order to address this problem. So you would need a secretary, apart from the leader, secretary is typically somebody who's technically qualified, not a typical, you know, secretary who jots down, takes, uh, you know, some instructions or all that. He or she should be able to contribute to the HAZOP, but he or she has to document as the discussions happen and keep on documenting the, whatever is the outcome, because it's a brainstorming and a discussion session. So, what is the key elements that people are discussing and what are the key takeaways? Those have to be simultaneously recorded. Okay. And therefore that is done by a documentation procedure. Okay. It can be recorded, but you have to still generate a document. A mechanical engineer is the one who will probably look at the detailed engineering. Process design engineering is very important because it is the process where things will go wrong. And you know, the design first is the first layer of safety. Okay. So the process has to be really examined whether the process design is done correctly. A control engineer is important because instrumentations and control systems, safety systems would be in their domain, in his or her domain. So whether the safeguards are adequate or more instrumentation is needed, more safeguards, controlled safeguards or you know, safety instrumented systems are necessary, that has to be determined by that. Operations specialist, somebody who has good experience with the project. That's very important, okay? And of course, a project engineer. So therefore, these typically should be the typical team, all right? Now, you can co-opt others like R&D R &D person or civil engineer when you are examining the detailed engineering design, let's say of support of equipments and so on and so forth. So there could be others who are outside the team. So if there is a certain, you know, uh, question that the team is not able to really get an answer because either because it doesn't have the expertise or it doesn't have the experience of finding an answer to the question. So either they will co-opt another team member and discuss that question or post it to the external expert, get the answer and then integrate that in the document. All right. So it should not happen that you don't have the answer because you don't have the expertise and experience but you keep discussing it. There's no point in doing that because it is not going to lead to any fruitful result. So that's how it is. So typically, you know, you need a certain level of documentation to be available in order to do the HAZOP. The first is essentially the, the process and or piping and instrumentation diagrams because that is the detailed engineering diagram. You need process flow diagrams. You have done that in your design course perhaps general arrangement drawings in the sequence of equipments, the relief venting philosophy. So Professor Nabar had mentioned sizing of relief. Okay, so that is basically part of the venting philosophy. Okay, so we will see that later on in the later part of the course, how you size the vent. 
Okay. Now, why is that important? Because if the vent is too small and if the vapor generation inside the equipment is very quick, so it will lead to the rate of vapor generation if it exceeds the rate at which is being vented through a narrow pipeline, internal pressure will rise and therefore it will go towards a catastrophic failure. Okay. So the sizing has to be done very accurately. Okay. So that is very important. The chemical hazard data is obviously important. Piping specifications, process data sheets in terms of you know, actual experience of operation if there is a prior experience and any previous safety reports of you know, previous operation. These are some general you know, a kind of uh, documentation which is important. So it means that you cannot do the HAZOP when you are trying to select a technology because you don't yet have the, these details. Process and piping instrumentation diagrams is not available. That will happen after you do the basic design. Okay? So certain level of maturity has to happen before you do the HAZOP in terms of documentation. Okay? So typically what happens is that you take the PNID as your key reference document and you mark up the diagram with other information because it is difficult to simultaneously look at five different sources when you do that analysis. Okay? So it's best to have a single document and put all other information in that document so that it becomes a single point reference. Now these are the guide words that you typically use in a, in a HAZOP. Uh, in conjunction with the process parameters. So when you apply the guide word no or not, okay, the, it's a quantitative guide word, guide word. So it means that no part of the design intention is being achieved, but nothing else is wrong. Okay? Only that the particular design intention. So you say that okay, that pipe has to uh, is designed for you know, 5 kg per second of a hydrocarbon flow. So when you say no plus flow, flow is the parameter, okay, that means there is no flow. That where there should be 5 kg per second of flow, there is no flow. So that is the deviation. That is obviously an abnormal situation. You have not designed it for that, but that's an abnormal situation. So no flow. So if you have an agitator in a reactor, suppose the agitator fails, agitation is also an important parameter in a reactor where especially if there is a you know, possible runaway. And so if there is no reaction that is happening, now if you, you can apply it to no plus pressure, no pressure, what does it mean physically? That means there is vacuum instead of pressure. Where it should be pressurized, now it has become a vacuum. Okay? So that is, the, that is the meaning of the combination of guide word plus parameter. More or less is also quantitative. So if you say more plus flow, then you say more flow than what is the normal, you know, within the control envelope, it's more than that. Less flow is that which has dropped below the control envelope. Okay. So it's a quantitative change in the parameter. More pressure, low pressure, more temperature, you know, less temperature. Please remember that this is outside the control envelope, not the normal envelope. As well as is a qualitative guide word. Okay. It means all the other intention is achieved, but some additional activity also occurs. So suppose you have, you know, a line which is pumping, let's say, a hydrocarbon X. Okay. Now, when I apply to, to the guide word flow, and then I say as well as plus flow, it means apart from that hydrocarbon X, Y is also coming. So that means that's a deviation. You have not designed it for that. Under normal conditions, only X should be coming. So apart from that, Y is also coming. Now, this is the scenario. That means apart from X, Y is also coming. Now, you can appreciate, if I give you the pipeline, can you actually come out with that? If I don't have this structured way of generating the deviation situation. I am applying the parameter to the guide word. And its meaning is that something else apart from what is supposed to come is also coming. I, I told you that if you just walk into the plant and try to answer the question, what can go wrong, it's not easy. So, but this is giving you a structured way of coming up with a deviation, which can eventually lead to the accident scenario. All right. So it is the first step in the propagation of the scenario. Okay. So additional component. Now, suppose you are 
uh, actually it's a liquid that is is designed for liquid flow. What what happens if there is a vapor flow also apart from that? So it's a multi-phase flow. Now that is not a normal situation because you have not designed it for non under normal conditions. You are not expect it is the pipeline is not expected to carry vapor. It is only expected to carry liquid. But apart from that, vapor is coming. So that is the abnormal situation when you have applied it to phase. Okay, phase is an a design parameter as well as plus phase gives you that apart from liquid vapor is also coming or there is some solid that is coming. Now the question is that the team will have to ask can it actually happen or not. So this is a cause, this is a deviation that you have generated but can it really happen in actuality. So you will have to apply your process information and your experience to really find an answer that this is not a trivial cause or this is a trivial cause. If it's a trivial cause, you don't, you know, worry about it anymore. Okay. The, but the genuine causes have to be subjected to better understanding in finding out, you know, what would be the cause of that deviation and what would be the consequence. Okay. Carrying out an additional activity, this will typically happen when there is a procedure. So remember that procedures can also be subjected to HAZOP. We will look at this. So this is a general list. We will look at how you apply this concept of HAZOP to a procedure. Now, as you may say, this is typically for a process which is running continuously. So when you have a continuous flow and then you say suddenly you say no flow or more flow, less flow. So it's a continuous process to which all these guide words will apply. But procedures are batch because when you apply, when you are doing a procedure, then there is a sequence of steps. You are first year to do A, followed by B, then C, then D, etc., etc., to complete the procedure apart, you know, in managing that hardware. Okay. Now, part of, so only part of the intention is achieved, but part is not. Suppose it's a mixture that is supposed to come to the pipeline, a binary mixture, but one of the component is missing. So that means part of the intention is there, but other part is not there. That's also a deviation. So the question is that, so when I apply the part of two flow, it means that some component in the line is missing. Okay, which is an abnormalcy. Okay, therefore that has to be subjected. If it's possible, then if it's a mixture, then there is possible. So you have to find out the cause for it and what is the consequence of it. The reverse means exactly opposite of what is supposed. So what is the design intention? If the flow is from X to Y, the flow is actually happening from Y to X. So instead of a flow in this direction, which is the natural sequence, you have a heat exchanger in which the reactants are heated, then put into the heat reactor, okay, for the temperature at which the reaction is supposed to take place, okay. But instead of that, the flow is actually happening from the reactor to the heat exchange. That's a complete reverse. So reverse plus flow, that means reverse flow. Can it happen? Well, you'll have to look at the process and figure out whether that is a possible scenario. It does happen. It does happen and that's why you may have seen that in your design course, you typically install a NRV, non-return valve or a check valve. It is to prevent the reverse flow, especially when the reverse flow can lead to a hazard. And other than is, you know, whatever is the design intention, that does not happen, but something else happens. You are supposed to pump X through that pipeline, but instead of X, Y is coming. Can it happen? I'll show you an example where it can happen. Okay, when the same equipment, same process is used for multiple product processing, in typical batch processes, in pharmaceutical, you know, APIs which are manufactured, you may use the equipment to manufacture one API for some time and then use it to manufacture another API, you know, after that. So, therefore, there is a possibility that you are actually processing different chemicals in the same plant. Now, you have taken it to process API A, but somehow, you are pumping in material which is pertinent to API B because the setup is connected to the raw materials which are useful for B also as it is also connected to 
materials uh, feed feed for uh, api b api a as well but by mistake suppose you have kept when you are running it for api a you have kept the valve bringing material for b also open so then instead of a api b is actually the api, the material for api b is coming but the the process and the plant is primed for manufacturing of a not b okay so therefore it can be hazardous situation api b needs low temperature api a needs high temperature so actually your high temperature which you don't need for api b but it is coming so it's a hazardous situation so therefore it can happen so the so therefore uh, okay these are the reason why you uh, i mean that that's the interpretation when you apply other than so these are six guide words and you can have whatever are the process parameters when you combine them you get the get the actual deviation and then you hunt for cause and causes so this is how a typical p and id looks like okay it's fairly complicated you see it is not a process design only process design will simply give you the equipments and the flow rates and the pressure and temperatures okay but here if you see every instrument is actually included every safety safeguards pressure relief valves alarms everything is included here that's why it looks so cumbersome okay it's a highly congested kind of a p and id it's better to actually split the p and id so that you know maybe you could simply have one p and id which is just the reactor so that you can actually see very clearly what are all the instrumentation what are the different ports and everything here it's very difficult to read okay but somebody who seasoned would be able to quickly figure out so this is the input to the hazop because you already have the process design you can mark up the temperature pressure okay the flow rates here also to through each pipelines and you can also see all the existent safeguards so suppose you come up with the situation that okay there is a possible runaway but the existence and then you decide okay you need a alarm and you need a manual intervention and then somebody says okay we you think of having a safeguard like a emergency shutdown system but it may already be there so therefore once you look at it you you can make sure that okay it's already included so we don't need there is no further action item in so far as this scenario is concerned so all that you want to do is already there so that means there will be no further action items there in respect to that particular scenario that you are looking at okay now obviously this is more complicated and but this is what you have to use for hazop let's take an actual example so you have a reactor and there are two materials which are have to be reacted in the reactor to form a product c now each of the material storage tanks material a and b they are stored there and they would have their own level gauges and so on now why do you need a level gauge to to ensure that there is material there okay at the time of operation then you have these separate valves and you have a pump in each line because it will pump the material from the storage tank into the reactor now from the basic technology it is known that the concentration of a and b the flow rates have to be matched in such a manner that the rate of flow of b must not exceed that of a and if it does happen there is a potential possibility of a explosion happening in the reactor okay now it's a very simplified kind of a scenario now i give you this plant i then i tell you to really figure out what can go wrong in this plant so yeah you can think of immediately start thinking of what will fail etc but what is the best way to do it let's say they will take up a hazop study of me how many equipments do we have we have storage tank a storage tank b and the reactor at least in this part of the diagram so now downstream there could be other equipment you know for separation and all that because there will be some material coming along with unreacted material coming with let's say product c then you have to have distillation column and purify and so on and so forth but in so far as our immediate study is concerned this is the boundary of the study okay now as i said we need to apply the hazop to individual equipment now the way to start is to identify individual equipment and then take up 
the design intention, add all the guide words sequentially to those design parameters, generate deviation, find out the cause and the consequence. Okay, so so you can take storage material, storage tank A as your equipment. Okay, now it's simply storing. So what is the design parameter? What is the design intention? You have to design that tank. You have done that in your design, you know, project. You have to design a storage tank. How do you design a storage tank? That is downstream. I'm not interested in what is happening downstream. I'm designing the storage tank. So what is the design intention? What is the design intention meant? What are the parameters for which I'll design it? Obviously, capacity is a design parameter. What else? The temperature. Ah, corrosive is the material of construction. That is something that you choose. Okay. That is part of the design, but it is not a process design. Process design means you have to assume the temperature, pressure, and the capacity. What else? The normal level. The normal level to which it should be maintained. Okay, because that is what it should. Because you have a normal level, you will ensure flow. If the level falls drastically below that, you may not have flow. If it's gravity driven flow. Okay, all right. Similarly for storage tank B. Now if I move to the reactor, so that is another equipment. What would be the design intention? You have to maintain certain temperature, certain pressure, and certain level because there is an overflow there. If there is an excess material, it should overflow. That is the design. Okay. Temperature, pressure, what else? And the concentration, inlet concentration. Because when you design a reactor, how do you design? You use reaction kinetics to determine the volume, okay, and thermodynamics to choose the temperature and pressure. Okay. What else is there where you can apply HAZOP in this setup? The pipeline. The pipeline between the storage tank, because there things can go wrong. We have just discussed, you know, flow, temperature, pressure, and phase. So all those can deviate. So the pipeline. Let's, for the time being, you ignore the storage tank. Let's take the pipeline. So there are two pipelines. So I'll have to take each of them in turn and carry out the HAZOP. All right. So let's take the material, the line A. That's the pipeline. What is the design intention? It would be sized. Okay. It should have a certain pressure. Pressure may not be important because if it's close to normal pressure, that is not an important parameter. Okay. The flow is important. The temperature is important. Okay. Why is flow important? Because of the hazard. Flow rate of A and B have to be primed in such a manner so that you cannot have excess of B. So the flow rate is an important parameter. And that flow rate in turn will determine the size of the pipeline. That is the detailing part of it. Okay. Now, the design intention is to actually have a certain flow rate at some temperature and some, you know, pressure. And then it goes to the tank. Now, so please note that unlike the equipment, a pipeline is an extended entity. The equipment is here, it has a certain volume. But if you take a pipeline, it can extend over 30 meters because it's coming from the upstream side, which is the tank and it's going to the reactor. Intervening point can be 30 meters or even more, depending on the layout. Now, therefore, where should I look for the deviation? So, therefore, I have to identify what is called a node, where I'll apply the combination of the guide word and the process parameter. Okay. So where will I take the node? Let's say for A, should I take the node here at this point, at this point, this point, or at this point? So what would be your commonsensical sort of answer to that question? I have four nodes, in fact, four possible nodes, just downstream of tank A, after the valve, okay, just at the inlet, okay, it can be here. It can be here or it can be here. Okay. 
just upstream of the pump. It can be here, it can be here. So where should I choose the node? Because it's the same pipeline. So what, which node should give me the best sort of condition for figuring out what can go wrong in this pipeline? Which node should you consider for this pipeline? What would be a commonsensical answer to that question? We'll catch it, we'll do it here at this point. Because there is no further instrumentation or any other, you know, entity after that. It is the reactor, okay? Because if I look at any deviation there, I should be able to catch all possible reasons because of all different units which are upstream. If I do it here and I say no flow, then it's only the tank which I'm worried about. Okay, but if I take here, there can be multiple reasons why there is no flow. Okay, so therefore, maybe the valve is closed, maybe the pump is not working, maybe there is no material in this tanky. So therefore, there, I'll be able to catch all possible causes. So that is the philosophy of creating the node. So that you are able to catch, as I said, the disturbances will originate in the upstream side. So it's best to catch everything from the upstream side. Okay, so let's see how it is done. Choose a line node, say the line transferring A to the reactor. The design intention is described by the flow sheet and the process control requirement to transfer A at some specified rate. The control system is not shown here, but obviously it has to be there because flow is critical. Because you already know that flow rates of A and B have to be monitored very closely. One should not exceed the other in a proportion that is desired. So choose a process parameter now, flow. Flow in that line. So I am the node is the line, the pipeline, not the reactor or the, or the storage vessel, but the line itself, process line itself. Okay, that is very much a part of the equipment. Then I apply the first, which is no. No plus flow, that means where there should be a certain flow rate, there is no flow at all. Then you find out the causes. What could be the possible causes? Either your supply tank is empty, the pump has failed, okay, the upstream pump has failed, the pipeline is fractured, isolation valve is closed, okay. Though so there could be, see, for a single scenario, there can be multiple causes, okay. So here you have to enlist all the causes in one column. For an identified deviation, no flow. So you first write flow, which is the parameter, then you write a column of guide word, which is no in this case and then the combination, the deviation, no flow, and then you write the causes in the fourth column. That is a typical HAZOP worksheet example. Any other reason for no flow? It, it will depend. I mean, you can then examine the sheet, flow sheet, and say that there could be other reasons as well, okay? But please note that you should not worry about any other thing apart from no flow. Don't say that as well as something else is coming or other than a, something else is coming, nothing of that kind. That will come up when you actually add that guide word to flow. So you have to hold your patience and wait for its turn to come. So take one guide word at a time for a particular and then for a single parameter run through all the six guide words. Keeping the parameter fixed. Now once you have completed it, then move on to the next parameter. Again, run it through all the guide words, okay, and then do that. Now, these are the causes. They could be multiple cause. What is the consequence? Now you have to hunt for consequence. What would be the consequence? Is this something that the team has to decide? Sorry? It will drop. Then, the consequence, I mean the accident scenario. Flow rate of B will exceed that of A eventually. And therefore, there is a possibility of an incident. Hence, the risk of an explosion. Okay. So therefore, there is a hazard in the design. Why there is a hazard? It's a potential. It is a possible that there can be no flow for various reasons. And those are real reasons. They are not something which is unreasonable. You may not have material in the tank itself. How do you counter that? 
So that is a cause. But if you see the consequence is all the same for all the causes. But each cause will have to be attended by different action items. How will you ensure that there is the supply tank is not empty? So you have to ensure that because you have figured out no flow is a potentially a, a bad scenario which can lead to an accident. What will you do? What is the action item? So you should have a low level alarm which is an action item therefore. If there is no low level alarm, okay, no, you could have somebody manually doing it. Suppose you have entrusted it that to a worker who is supposed to periodically visit and look at the level gauge. Okay, so there is an existent safeguard. Why are you saying that I should have a level alarm? What should prompt you to actually this? Because an, each action item will mean that you have to, this is a safety investment. It's an additional investment. How will you justify that investment? You already have, as part of your procedure, you have a man who is trained. I mean, at least that's what, it is less expensive. You just have to tell him it's a routine, a routine thing. He has to simply look at the level gauge and if it falls below, okay. Now the question, why should it fall below? You can go one layer beyond it also. Why should it actually go below? Obviously, it means something which has happened upstream upstream of the tank. Maybe it's not filled properly on the... Now, the question is why do you want an additional this thing? Why do you need an alarm? See, it is beyond the manual intervention. The question that you would like to simply ask that suppose there is actually no material, okay, actually, and the worker has not detected it because he's not there at that point of time. So you have a scenario, it's a possibility. So therefore that has to be countered and that is why since potentially the risk is high, you are suggesting an additional layer of safety, an alarm. Okay. Now you may ask what if the alarm is not working at that point of time, then what do you do? So then you say, okay, then, uh, you know, should you add another layer of safety? What layer of safety can you actually say? Okay, it's possible. Alarm is not working continuously. Alarm could fail at the point of time when actually the level has dropped. So it could be in a failed condition. So it will not be detected. Yeah, so all these would have to come out as your action items because these are sort of things that you have to show. You, what you could do, you can interlock line B with A. That's an emergency shutdown. So that is an extra layer of safety. It is probably, it is not there in the PNID as I've shown you. There is no interlock there. So therefore, if you see, you are systematically coming up with recommendations by identifying the scenario. Okay, now, so we, if you take the next guide word, more, more of A passes to the reactor, then what should? Cause could be pump is producing excessive flow. The control system, which is controlling the flow of A, is not working properly. These are the likely causes. So A will go, you know, more A will go. What is the consequence? Product C is contaminated with C but there is no possibility of a risk of explosion now because it is not that B has exceeded A. A has exceeded B in the proportion. So there is no possibility of the earlier hazard, but the product will become more contaminated with unreacted A, which itself is a problem because that will stress your downstream part of the plant. So it is not a hazard, but it's an operability problem. That is why the word hazard and operability are clubbed together. So not all deviations will necessarily be a hazard. The first one is, the second one is not. Okay, well it's, but what would be your wiser answer? It is too premature to say whether excess A in C is a hazard or not. Because you have to now, when you look at the next equipment, how will you catch that? When you take the next equipment, 
how will you catch that a is coming along with c which is the possibility when you apply the guide word as well as in the next unit that means apart from c something else is coming so you would have already done the reactor because you are moving from upstream to downstream so the idea that a can contaminate c is already documented so when you take the next equipment it's very easy to figure out that you have already identified that scenario in the upstream side the reactor so excess a can come now as far as this is concerned the equipment this looks like an operability problem but it could be a hazard because suppose a is more volatile and you are processing it in a high pressure equipment okay or high temperature equipment so a will volatile is very very rapidly and pressurize the equipment so it becomes a hazard is no longer an operability problem okay so therefore it's too premature so that's why i'm saying you know excess flow will also lead to overflow are these hazards or operability problems so further information analysis of downstream effects is needed so therefore if you see you have to sequentially move from upstream to downstream and the wisdom in doing that is that disturbances are already being caught in the upstream side and they would propagate downstream so when you take the downstream equipment one after the other you would have already identified the deviations which will simply get so you will just pull that and put in your document that okay i have already identified this so therefore you know apart from c something else is coming as well as okay and so on so okay we will stop here and we'll continue this case study in the next class there are more case studies there is one in your handout which i have given you can may like to look at it i'll take it up in the next class so the main thing is what i'm trying to say is that hazop gives you a structured way of answering asking the right question otherwise just a plant you wouldn't know what question to ask to begin okay